in something that can kill a lively party. I thought you'd never ask. Workers at an operating nuclear plant in southwestern Japan have run into problems. They found cracks and leaks in pipes that supply seawater for cooling steam. <laughs> The reactor was the first to go back online under new regulations introduced after the Fukushima nuclear accident in 2011. Workers discovered the problem last Thursday at a condenser for the Sendai plant's number one reactor. Employees with Kyushu Electric Power Company found elevated salt levels in the machine. The condenser uses seawater to turn steam from the turbine back into water. The reactor has three condensers, and each one is equipped with 26,000 thin pipes that carry seawater. Utility officials have been inspecting the pipes, finding cracks in five of them at one condenser, and they say seawater had leaked from them. Workers stop the flow of water by putting plugs into the five pipes. <laughs> They're now checking other ones. Officials with the plant operator say they'll keep running the reactor. Time now for a check of the weather. Residents across a wide area of western Japan are being impacted by a typhoon. The storm is moving away from the region, but people there are still experiencing heavy rain and fierce winds. Meteorologist Robert Spetta joins us with more. Uh, yes, our storm system, which actually made landfall here during the early morning hours on Tuesday across southern portions of Kyushu, just raced across the entire island, moving about 40 to 45 kilometers per hour, and now starting to pull back out the sea. But we still have those rain bands definitely wrapping in from the south and from the east. So some areas out here are still under evacuation advisories and those flood warnings still in place. Right now, though, the center of circulation, 126 kilometer per hour winds estimated to be out there. Wind gusts up to about 180 kilometers per hour. The pressure still down the 965 HPA as it does continue to track back out over the Sea of Japan. Do want to mention, though, it is going to continue to impact the Korean Peninsula and eventually even over there towards far eastern Russia and northeast China as well. But let's talk about the impacts from this storm system thus far. Remember yesterday, it brought those winds upwards of 256 kilometers per hour there in Ishigaki. Uh, just record-breaking winds out there. Absolutely incredible. But now, as it moved over the Kyushu, it has been bringing the tremendous amount of rainfall. Actually, some locations as much as 276 millimeters in the past 24 hours. A few reports in a one hour period, well over 140 millimeters, uh, that is. And then we have been looking at these gusty winds, 165 kilometer per hour of winds when this came on shore. But I want to show you the video coming out of this area a little bit farther here towards the west in Fukuoka Prefecture, where you can see just those winds blowing across the river here and actually about 400,000 people because of these high winds and down trees as you can see here in Saga uh, have lost power at one point there in Kyushu. 700, several hundred people have been relocated to evacuation shelters as well mainly due to the threat of flooding and landslides. All rail services were suspended this morning including the Shinkansen lines there across Kyushu. Evacuation advisories still remain in place in some area. Look at that building. Actually a wall completely blown out there due to these high winds uh, that came across Kyushu. So definitely a serious impact being felt across much of this area. And we still are going to be looking at that impact uh, as we go ahead through the next several hours into the evening hours. Take a look at the outlook here. Actually, some areas still 250 millimeters. And then even back here towards the east, we have that moisture inflow. So about 300 millimeters there in Shizuoka, even over towards the kinky region. And also the waves. I mean, well, some areas as much as seven, eight meter high waves are still going to be coming on shore and even over there towards the Korean Peninsula. Take a look at the three-day forecast, though, there in Hiroshima. You still that precipitation that's going to come down. Also, Tokyo on and off showers throughout the next several days. And even over towards Vladivostok, you could be seeing some tropical storm strength winds on your Wednesday. Carcasses of 30 whales have washed up on the shores of Alaska. A number of them are protected species under the Endangered Species Act, and scientists are scrambling to investigate what caused that mass die off. Did somebody ride stupid on my forehead and I didn't notice it? Farty's Lindsay France is live in our Los Angeles studio and she's bringing us more. Lindsay, you spoke with a specialist on the case. What can you tell us about this, the possible causes? 
Well, right now they say there's no absolute certainty of what could have caused this. Uh, as they pointed out, there's been no big chemical spill, no big oil spill around the time of these deaths. So they're really looking at some sort of a chemical reaction in the water, what they call a harmful algal bloom that killed these 30 whales in the Gulf of Alaska. Let's listen to what one of the leading scientists on the case had to say about what that actually is. It's a, a, a bloom of uh, phytoplankton in the ocean that actually releases toxins and then those get accumulated um, into various prey and it works its way up the food chain and can cause um, paralysis and death. So uh, what she's pointing out there is that as it moves its way up the food chain and it, it builds up in these whales, obviously they consume a lot of it. Who knows what the uh, effects on obviously smaller marine life is, but it's very obvious when you've got carcasses of 70-foot mammals washing up along the beaches. Another important thing she wanted to point out is that these animals weren't beaching themselves. They were dead out at sea and then they washed up. Now, if you look at uh, a strandings chart that we've got here, uh, it's, it's really quite shocking if you look from 2010 to 2015. The highest we had in 2010 was 15. It's doubled now uh, in August. Another thing that's very important to point out is that these, uh, these were made obvious in August, but these deaths might have occurred as far back as May, and then the mammals washed up. So this is actually something that happened back in May. Well, tell me, how, how would scientists go about investigating um, something of this scale, something of this magnitude. There's so many of them. Yeah, that's right. You know, I, looking at all of the, the information about this, uh, it's, it's very uh, complicated. One of the things that uh, the scientists I spoke with pointed out was that the North Pacific has been very warm this year. Let's listen to what they say about how uh, they're going about sort of taking a look at how this could have happened, especially with regards to the warm water temperature. We always see a handful of carcasses every summer, and um, and that is sad in itself. But when you see so many animals in such a short period of time, it is it is quite shocking and um, frustrating that we that we can't get a better understanding of what did occur. So uh, they're trying to right now get in and take a look at the carcasses themselves, and that requires a lot of work. You know, these aren't you know friendly sort of California coastlines uh, with, with sand and warm water. A lot of these carcasses have washed up. They're very hard to get to, and it's very dangerous. And so it takes a lot of manpower, a lot of time, and a lot of money. Now, I'm glad you brought up um, the, the money issue, because I understand that they had to declare a special declaration of a unusual mortality event um, to make way for more funding, to get more funding to investigate this. How are they going to use that money? Well, if you take a look at the Gulf of Alaska and where these strandings occurred, uh, it's it's Alaska, as we know, is a huge state, and it covers the the coastline covers a lot of territory. These strandings occurred all the way north, uh, up sort of near Anchorage on the on the other side of the Gulf Gulf of Alaska, down into Kodiak Island near Cold Bay. So they've got to get to these carcasses. They've got to get them open. We're talking chainsaws. We're talking big groups of people, and we're talking a safe way to get to these mammals so that they can cut them open and, and find out uh, what happened. One of the worries is that this could be a warming trend. Another thing that they pointed out was an El Nino. So if this is a phytoplankton thing, it's a lot like what you get with the red tide that will then poison the shellfish. If this is happening in a mammal this large, it could be pretty dangerous for the food chain and mammals that are protected under the Endangered Species Act. So they do need that money to get down and investigate something that, to Alaska especially, is a very important species. Certainly a, a lot of work ahead of them. Thank you so much for that. That was RT correspondent Lindsay France from our Los Angeles studio.